go straight on to lab five, which is the packet wire, but this time in micro C. Behind our curtain, it's the same picture, we're going to be processing packets. So we need to be delivering a packet to be processed, handling it, and forwarding it. So this lab is about literally receiving a packet, putting yourself into that sea of workers, put yourself into the sea of workers, receiving a packet, doing something. We're going to get you to look at the packet contents. Um, you can do some transactions, and then transmitting the packet. The way this really works in the hardware and the software is, and um, uh, it was mentioned earlier in the P4 side of things, that packets can be processed out of order by our workers. So we have a nice worker who's ready to run off and go off and do exciting things by getting keys and flow states and, and actions, and it's going to do statistics. It's all very pretty. Uh, but before that happens, we need to make sure that we are going to order things correctly. So in the hardware, we actually have, um, on the receive side, when a packet comes in, it's, uh, there's a sequencing. Take a ticket. A sequence number is provided with every packet. We then deliver the packets to the transactional memories. Then one of your workers gets the packet from the transactional memory. It gets delivered to the worker. It can do whatever it wants and take as long as it wants, different time for different packets. And when it transmits, it will be reordered using the appropriate, you know, now serving number 104 mechanism. So the flow for your worker is just, I want a packet. Give me a packet, please. Here's a packet. You wake up, you get a packet, you do whatever you want, take as long as you want, and then you send the packet. And really, that's all your lab is going to be doing. Receive a packet, do something, and then send it. Behind the curtains, though, what does give me a packet mean? What does you know, do a statistics operation mean? Well, we have this command push pull fabric that is tying the islands together, that's tying the micro engines together. There's a bus within each island, but there's a switch fabric actually between the islands. So you're getting a bit, really, you're getting your hands really dirty at this point. And actually, we get your hands really, really dirty right at the end of the next lab if you get that far. The CPP bus is actually, this is kind of the key driver behind the whole architecture. And the way it works is, um, as I said earlier, you know, these are transactional memories. Every memory is a transactional memory. They only do transactions. You post a transaction, and it may need some data. Data will happen, and it will do something, and then it will push a result. So even if you just want to read a memory or write a memory, you are issuing some magic posted transaction. The C compiler hides all of that. You didn't do any of that in lab one. There were implicit commands going on and implicit transactions happening in lab, sorry, lab one, lab four, in the, in the previous lab. In lab five, we start to be more explicit about these things. The top left shows two threads running. Uh, they could be in the same microengine, could be in different microengines. And you can see one's doing a write and one's doing a read. These are posted transactions, so thread zero posts the write transaction to a memory. Could be the CTM, just as we did a moment ago. The memory will receive this transaction, the command, and it will say, oh, okay, good, I need to write. Okay, I'm going to write to this address he's given me. He said, write to this address. Okay, I'm going to write. I'm going to need the data for that. So sometime later, he has to get that data, and he gets the data by pulling it out of the microengine. So it's a command goes across, and there's a pull in order to make the, enable the memory to get the data it needs. It can then combine its memory data with the pull data and write it in. For the read in the top left, thread one doesn't read. It issues a read command. The read command doesn't need any data to be pulled. The read is just read. It's going to read the memory, and it needs to give that data back to the thread. So it will read the memory, and it will push that data back to the thread one. So in this way, we get posted transactions for writing and reading. This is what the bulk engines do, bulk read and bulk write. So it's a simple, simple in concept. There's a FIFO of commands going from everybody to the multiplex down to a memory, and it's got a FIFO of you know, things to, to organize to get pull data. And the, but it, it's basically a command, pull, and push. The one at the bottom is showing how we then do an atomic transaction. Well, we can atomic add. It's as far as 
the CPU is concerned at the moment, it's, it's just like a write. You get an atomic add instruction, it's going to need some data, so it will pull the data, it pulls the value, and the memory can combine the pulled data that it got, and it can store it into the memory. Same thing for um, if I want to do a test and add, the memory could then also push the data additionally if it wanted to, so you could get the pre-modified data, and you can do a whole bunch of simple atomics, or even more complicated atomics in that way. Um, third one also has this atomic plus immediate. Well, this is where it says in the command, in the transaction, you can say, here's, I want you to do an add. Oh, and by the way, the number's one. Just add one to it, because I can give you this immediate value, because I don't need it. It's, it's a small number. You don't need to pull the data. Uh, and the memory can then just combine the data that's been given in the command with the memory. In this case, the thread can just keep running. If the threads need to have data pulled and pushed, they will stop execution until the data is gathered or returned. If you do a read, you want to keep going when the data has been read, so you have to wait for the push. So you can see on the thread lines that they get black, thick black lines when they're ready to run, when the signals happen, and they're thin if they're waiting. As you can see, thread one is ready even after it's done the atomic plus immediate. It's ready to keep going. It just keeps going. It doesn't need to wait for that to happen because the command has been given and all the data went with it. Uh, the last one is how we get packets. So how do you get a packet? Your thread says, give me a packet, please, Mr. Memory, Mr. System, Mr. Memory. Wait for work. The thread just waits. It's just like doing a read. Please read me the next packet, and it will go to sleep. The thread will go to sleep until a packet enters the system in the Mac MBI side of the world. That will be delivered to the memory, and it will be pulled and so on and so forth. And when that happens, that thread can be woken up. And the memory will kind of decide which thread gets which packet. First come, first serve. Uh, but um, you know, the same structure here works for reading and writing. It works for atomic transactions. It can be quite complicated ones, and it can work for getting packets. Just briefly here, the various memories support a whole bunch of different transactions. So we can do atomic ads, and we can get the packets. We can do statistics operations, as I said earlier, you know, do a whole bunch of statistics given a byte count and a packet count. We can do locks. Um, it's easy to do test and set, but you can do queued locks. Please give me, I, I want to lock that structure, and you'll be put on the waiting list. Your thread goes to sleep. When that lock is freed by somebody else, you will be given it at the last person. You basically, and you'll be get, everyone will get the lock in order that they request it. So you don't need a lot of the operating system that you would normally have in an operating system. You don't need a lot of those features for synchronization and so on. They're all in the memories. And there's a lot of other capabilities that are in these units. And now I'm going to hand over to Chris to actually get you to pass packets around. So uh, we're ready to go again. Uh, let's see. We're, we're going to this time be operating on a different set of code. So if you uh, still have your SSH sessions open, uh, then what we're going to be doing is still in the open nfp.git uh, directory in the app subdirectory, but this time we're going to uh, change directory into lab5. Okay, so we should be in open nfp.git slash apps slash lab5. Okay, and uh, in this, in this uh, directory, we'll find a little bit more than we had in, uh, in the previous one. In fact, why don't we, we didn't do a proper make clean. What is with you? No, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, he's human. So, I, so, so therefore, I was impersonating him correctly by being human. All right, very good. All right. Uh, we'll see a, uh, a series of, of C files. Uh, we'll see this uh, BLM custom file that is actually used to define how packet buffers are laid out in the system. Uh, we'll see a config file, which is general ha hash defines, max stats, which is used to fetch uh, statistics. And uh, then we see at the very, very bottom, and we see our make file and our readme, which again, this readme matches what you have on the pages or on the web page. And at the very bottom, we see wire.main. And that's where we're going to be spending most of our time in this exercise. And we won't have any cutting and pasting to do in this exercise, just a little bit of uh, deleting. Okay. 
So we're going to open up wire.main. And I want you to go to the end of that file. Open up wire.main, and, and you want to go to the end of that file. Oh, I'm sorry. I've skipped a step in this. this. We'll, before we actually dive into the code, let's look at how this code is going to be built and how that differs from the previous, uh, the previous uh, lab that we did. You may recall in the last lab that when we built the program, we, uh, when we built the program, we assigned the object code to two microengines, right? Uh, just i32.me0 and i32.me1. In this example, in this wire application, we're going to actually be assigning the code to many, many, many more. We're going to let, and we're going to let all the threads run. So this is actually more in line with what you would be doing in a real application. So I'm going to walk through uh, just how these lines work in the make file. Uh, some of it should be hopefully very familiar or a little familiar after the last lab. So the first line, again, is basically a compilation line. We're saying, OK, I want to compile wire object, wire underscore object, from wire main dot C. So that's going, to, that's going to compile our C file into our object file. And then we're going to say, uh, not only do I want that uh, object file, I want to include, we're going to add a whole bunch of other um, object files, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, libraries that are going to go into this program. So instead of just our wire file, now we're going to be including library code. And uh, this library code you're going to find is also going to be open sourced as well. It'll be available for use, inspection, improvement, and we encourage you to do so. Okay. Um, so we're including libraries NFP, packet, standard, and net in this case. And then we have this, this next line here that basically tells it, I also want you to include when building this, this config file. So this is a way of basically forcing it to use a particular set, a particular file for, uh, for essentially hash defines in compiling the program. And why would we do this? Well, the thing is that we might want to run the same program on different pieces of hardware. But different pieces of hardware have different uh, resources available and some different assignments. So you may want, as, in essence, a separate config file for each of those platforms that you want to compile for. We only have one in this case, it's the config.h that I pointed out earlier. Okay, So the, but that's what this line is doing, is saying, I want this config file included in the build process so we can get its hash defines, which will give us the platform definitions. And then uh, we see a line that is also uh, hopefully a little bit familiar, where we're saying, OK, I want to add object files to this program. And we're adding it to application wire. And the object file we're adding is wire underscore object. And then we have our ME assignment. And here we have a much longer list. We have I32 through uh, I32 ME0 all the way through I32 ME11. So we're now assigning all 11 microengines on island 32. We're assigning the wire object file to those microengines. And again, each one of those 12 microengines has eight threads. So essentially, 96 threads in that island are going to be running this code. And we see a similar line right below it with the only major difference being that the 32s are replaced by 33s. This is saying, OK, I want you to assign that same object file to I33 ME0 through ME11. So all those 12 microengines are also going to be running this same program. So now we've got 192 threads total that are all going to be running this same piece of code. Okay. Uh, and we have, we have five more general purpose islands and, and many more to go that we could include, but two seems enough. Okay. Uh, so we also need a few extra microengines that are going to be special purpose. Uh, so we will have this firmware add object to the wire application, the stats object. And this uh, stats object is defined a little higher up in the make file, right about here. See where I'm, I'm compiling? That stats object is going to be used for collecting statistics. 
and we're just going to uh, assign that to its own little microengine in island 34. So it's island 34 ME0. And then we have this uh, BLM object that is also getting its own private microengine. The BLM object is a special piece of infrastructure code whose job it is to recycle buffers that have been transmitted back to the ingress block so that they can be used for receiving packets. And again, you generally don't have to worry about this when writing your program. You just have to know that you're going to be including a BLM component and assigning it to one of your MEs somewhere in the, in the system. Uh, and then we have our firmware link with RT Sims. So this calls link for the wire application. It says, okay, link it. And then we also have a call to firmware add PPC. Now PPC stands for Packet Processing Core. And what that, uh, what that is, is there are special purpose classification engines living right next to the ingress ports of the traffic coming in off the wire. And this is basically loading firmware onto those uh, pre pre-compiled firmware onto those packet processing cores so they can, they can do their job. And uh, we're not going to go into how to, how to deal with any of that today, but just be aware that that's what that last is. We, we, we have a prepackaged firmware for those, for those packet processing cores to do very basic packet movement in and out of, uh, well, in from the wire, and, uh, and we have to hand it that firmware as part of this. Uh, as part of this, because you see, our last exercise, we didn't have to do this because we weren't dealing with any packets. We weren't moving packets in and out. We didn't need any of this infrastructure code. But now that we're actually moving packets, we actually need a little bit extra software infrastructure to make it up and, and, and get it going and running. But fear not, when you get the open source version of this, it will come with batteries included. All of the code, all of this code will be a part of it and you'll be able to use it, along with examples for how. So uh, that uh, completes the, the build for, what, for, for, this, uh, for this code. Uh, well, before I leave out questions about this. Yes? Yes. Isn't it an amazing IDE? Yes, yes. It generated all of the dependencies. It laid out all the microengines. It added in all the infrastructure blocks. And more besides, it added in code to do, to, you know, it automatically generated the table matching code and so forth and so on. And yes, it, it put in all of this and glued it all together for you and then linked it together. Yes. Uh, can you repeat the number of threads per microengine? The number of what microengines? Threads. The number of threads per microengine. No, you can, uh, but we aren't. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. In 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 the application, yes, we we li we limited it. Yes. Well, with P four, you can use pretty much unlimited options as well. I mean, you can you can you can have all of the threads. It's just that our example didn't, if, and we did that for purposes we did that for purposes of making it easier to debug, so that the packet would always go into the thread that we were anticipating it would go in. And so we could inspect the state of that thread and see what the extracted headers were and so forth and so on. Yeah. But yes, in, in general, when we're, we, we use as much, of, as much resources in the P4 environment as, as are available um, in, the, in the usual case. Okay. Yes. Yes, so what happens, so how do the thread, the question was how do the packets get scheduled to the threads? So what happens is, from the, from the processor's perspective, what happens is each of the threads goes and, as Gavin said, requests a packet. And it then goes to sleep and waits for it to be signaled that a packet is ready for it to process, along with the data about that packet that it needs to process it. Okay? Um, and those threads happily quiesce and, and, and just wait, dumb, until the, the packet arrives. 
the CPP hardware, I'm sorry, the, the hardware in the chip, when packets arrive, will then push those, push the information, well, will push that packet into buffers in the memory of the, uh, in, inside the memory of the NFP, and then will push the metadata about that packet to the threads and basically wake the threads up and say, here, you've got a packet. Here's everything you need to know about it, what buffer it's in, what length it is, uh, maybe some metadata, what port it came in on, things like that. Maybe some extracted headers uh, that come in, right, uh, that are pre-parsed, that come in from our ingress block. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? Ah, the question is, if a packet needed to be processed by 10 threads, in this example, in the model that we're currently just going through, each packet will get touched by one thread alone, in this example. Um, it will receive the packet, it will do all of the operations that it needs to perform on that packet from beginning to end, through the lifetime of that packet, and then when it is done, it will transmit or drop that packet, maybe duplicate it and send another one, and it could, it could do that as well. But it will do everything it, it wants to do on that packet and, and then before releasing it, okay? Um, and, that, and that is a nice, simple, easy way to write your software. You don't have to worry about how you're decomposing the problem. You write it in a very natural way. Step one, I do this with the pa I receive the packet. Step two, I'm going to count some things about the packet. Step three, I'm going to classify the packet. You could, you could just one, two, three, four, and then done. And you get your, uh, you get your speed in such a program from the fact that there are many cores running, and from the fact that you saw that some of these threads have to go to sleep at times while waiting for transactions, but we have eight hardware threads on each core, and while that thread is sleeping, other threads can be busy processing their packets. And so, they, so basically you hide the latency of those posted transactions behind the threading model. Now it is possible, now I said this is our default mode of operation, but it is possible for you to write software in a different way. You can very well have a packet received by one, have a packet come in and be received by one set of threads, and then use something like our, the, uh, the rings that Gavin briefly put up uh, that are supported in our transactional memories to pass that packet over to another thread or another pool of threads that they can do some work on it and then they can pass it on to another and they can do something about it. So that's a much more complicated model of processing and it, it usually isn't necessary in this architecture, but it can be done. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess it could be, I guess that's a matter of personal preference, if you want to, how you want to decompose the problem. Um, it could, one could consider that a nicer model of coding, but it isn't necessary. So, the question was asking about software pipelines. So, Evan's nodding because he agrees. But the question was about software pipelines. <laughs> Other questions before we move on? Okay. All right, so let's take a look in this wire main program, okay? and. He's laughing at something, but I don't know. It is very blue. It's not easy. No. All right, but we're going to go to the end where it's, well, it's still very blue. We're going to go to the end of the program. At the very end of the program file, you'll find the main program, uh, the main entry point. And this is where we will find what this program is actually doing. And, and by default, what you will see is it's actually not doing enough. In fact, the blue is very helpful here because it just looks like white space because nothing that's happening in blue is actually happening. So if we only read what is legible on the screen, what we see is we enter an infinite loop. Each thread will enter an infinite loop, and then it will receive a packet, and then it will send that packet right back out. And it's going to send it back out the same port that it was received. Okay. So the, the blue is very good, actually, in this case. <laughs> So this is this is the uh, this is this is the you know the the hello world of well the hello world too I suppose you could say of this of this code where we're just receiving and sending packets echoing back out we have the netronome packet echoer I guess all right so uh, all of that code is ready to run is ready to build so you can just type make 
And this make takes a little bit longer, but not much. And you can see that big long line uh, command line that occurs when you issue make, and that's where it is assigning that same object to all of those different uh, micro engines and say it's got to run here, it's got to run here, it's got to run here. Again, absolute control is available. You're still laughing. Okay. Uh, let's look at our, uh, our wire.map file. Remember the last time we, did, we inspected the map file and told us about what symbols were generated? And we see a whole big mess. And why do we see a whole big mess? Well, it, it actually boils down to, as I said, we have all these infrastructure blocks, and they're declaring private data structures that they need. So uh, a lot of that is, uh, it, in fact, most of that is, is just infrastructure data. But let's, let's, let's focus in a little bit and look mainly at the top. And in fact, really the first uh, three or four lines. Um, and what you'll see is uh, those first, the, the, uh, the lines that are i32.stats and underscore counters and i33.stats those are actually variables that we declare in our wire code. And uh, they have gotten assigned to memory. Um, and we're going to come back to those data structures uh, shortly in terms of inspecting what's there and what they do. But right now, nothing's going to happen to them because all we're doing is receiving and sending packets. We're not touching those stats. We're not touching those counters. But I want you to be aware that they're there. Okay. So. Now, we, we're going to start this program a little bit differently from the way we started Lab 4. Uh, for this one, we're going to run a, an initialization script. And in this directory, you'll find it is dot slash init wire.sh start wire.firmware. Uh, before I do that, I'll just show you. There, we generated wire.firmware in our make file. There it is. So we'll try. So we're going to. Start that firmware up. Okay. Okay, so this is now where this is the stage where it is actually loading the firmware on, initializing the chip, initializing the max so that it can receive packets, and then it finally starts the firmware up and running at the end. So now we actually have firmware that is running and, and those threads are moving. Unlike the last time where we did it in stages, where we loaded it, inspected it and started it running this script, uh, and, and started it running later, this script did all of that for us. St uh, start, loaded the firmware and started it up. Okay. So uh, now, in order to actually demonstrate what this thing is doing, we need a second terminal window. And I'm going to have to increase the font size here, aren't I? Second appearance change fourteen. Apply. Good. Good. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something similar to what we did in the previous labs. We're going to use TCP replay to send a packet in. Unlike the last time where we expected it to come out some other port, this packet is going to be coming back out the same port that it came in. So we're just going to run a Wireshark on our Fortville interface to capture both the outgoing and the incoming packet. So we are using T-Shark instead of TCP dump. Dash X, dash I, P4, P1. And we will be ready to capture packets. Okay. Now we're going to go back to our original window, and here we're going to replay the packet. So we will TCP replay dash I P4 P1 tilde slash UDP one pat underscore one. No, there is no UDP one packet, so I'll just use UDP dot PCAP. UDP dot PCAP, or on the, the sheet, it was UDP one packet. It was supposed to be on there. Maybe it's not on my server, but it's on yours. Either one should be fine. Okay. And we're going to replay it. Pow. And that's what you should see. And then we should go look in the other window and see what it saw. And if everything is right, we should see two of them. 
Oh yeah, I forgot the, the system is down. Oh, okay. A little bit of payload in there. So there we see the outgoing packet and the return packet. Okay? One going out, one going back. So that's what the firmware did. It, it just did a simple echo. So now let's, let's dig a little bit into how this is working, okay? Okay. Oh. Let's, let's look at those, those, that wire main function. And I'm looking at my for loop, and I'm looking, here's our first step, receive packet. So let's go look into that receive packet a little bit and see what it is actually doing to receive the packet. Um, uh, you may recall, as part of our build process, we included the packet library. Well, here are calls into that packet library to actually perform packet reception. So we say, okay, I want this thread to receive the next packet, and I want to receive... Uh, the size of uh, basically a certain amount of metadata along with this packet as it's coming in. Okay, so uh, we're passing in this data structure and we're telling it how much metadata we want to receive along with it. Is? You need to be done by 3.15. What time is it? I need to be done by 3.15, so we got to be done. Huh? 3.15. So we've got to move along fast, is what you're saying. We're over time. Okay. So uh, just walking through, I will have to do it briefly then. Uh, do you have any advice on which sections to do besides the packet receives in? Everything and just show it. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, we are, so essentially what's happening in this function, just receive, just quickly, is we are receiving in some packet metadata. We are uh, tracking some information about the packet. Here is the starting offset that this packet arrived at, the island that we are, uh, that we're receiving it on, the packet number, the packet buffer that it was, it was and the header, the, fir the first he set of headers that came in with the packet. And uh, this is actually just a pointer to the header, this packet, this, this uh, packet header uh, variable. We're saying, give me the pointer to the start of the headers. And then the next thing it does is it reads in data from the packet buffer and copies that data into our local data structure to track the, the, the first headers in this packet. Okay? So that's packet receive. And now let's, let's, we're going we're gonna to move along quickly. So we're going to actually start uncommenting. We're going to uncomment rewrite packet and count packet and stats packet. So what's going to happen is for each packet we're going to execute, we're not after we receive, we're going to rewrite the packet, then we're going to count it, and then we're going to use a stats operation on it. And then finally we will echo it back out. And let's look quickly at what we're going to do to rewrite it. When we rewrite the packet, what we're going to do is we're going to inspect uh, whether there is a VLAN tag on this packet. So we're saying, okay, in the packet, in the packet header, is the protocol ID a VLAN tag? And if it is, I want you to extract the VLAN. And after we extract the VLAN, if it is two or three, I want you to replace the VLAN that is there with, the, with that VLAN XORed with one. So two becomes three, and three becomes two. So we're rewriting uh, VLAN two with VLAN three, or VLAN three with VLAN two. Okay? So that's, that's what we're going to do for a rewrite. And because it's in the Ethernet header, we have no need to modify checksums or any of that nonsense. Uh, counting the packet. The counting operation is, is uh, also going to use the extracted packet headers. So first thing it's going to do is, is check, is there a VLAN tag? If there is no VLAN tag, then we're going to increment the counter, counters.noVLAN. Uh, if there is a VLAN tag, we're going to see, is it VLAN2? If it's VLAN2, we will inter increment counters underscore VLAN2. If not, we'll check, is it VLAN3? If it's VLAN3, we will increment counters VLAN3. And otherwise, we will increment counters VLAN other. So we're just basically saying, OK, is there a VLAN? If there is, is it 2? Is it 3? Uh, and please increment the appropriate counter depending on what you find in that packet. Okay? So there's our, how we're doing our simple little counting in this app example. And then the stats, and it's very similar for the stats. We're, again, checking for 
VLAN 2, for no VLAN, VLAN 2, VLAN 3, or some other VLAN. And we are, in each case, uh, what we'll be doing is saying, okay, depending on which one we want, that tells us the address of the stats variable we want to add an increment to. And then, and this is where things get a little interesting, we execute this embedded little bit of assembler. This embedded little bit of assembler is actually going to post a transaction to the cluster local scratch memory to do a both an increment of a packet count and a uh, an increment of a packet count and an addition of a byte count in the same operation. Okay. And so this shows you, you know, in this C language, not only do we have control over where this code is running, but we can even drop down to the bare assembler of the chip if we need to, to get all the way down to the bare instructions. Okay. And then here's our send packet. I'm not going to go through that other than to say it's still sending out the same packet. Okay, so. We will save this file, and I'd left the firmware running, so before I'm going to build, I'm going to, let's see, what is it, stop? Just like that? Okay, so you run init wire.sh stop. That will stop the firmware. Make sure to do that before we go any further. And then we can, well, actually, you can do the next step, which is just to type make and rebuild the firmware now with those other operations uh, now, uh, now in place. Okay. okay. So now we should be ready to, uh, now we should be ready to, to actually run it again. So same command as before wire.sh start wire.firmware. We will run it. We will let the threads get to the point where they're, well, as soon as we've, it's finished, we'll, the threads will all be eagerly awaiting a packet. And I have packets now? What, who sent them? I think the VLAN ones, oh, they weren't on there. Okay, good, thank you. Very good, very good, okay. So for this one, uh, first we will do the TCP replay. So we will do TCP replay dash I P4P1, our physical port, uh, UDP tilde slash UDP dot PCAP. And this again, will this will, this will normally be pretty boring, right? This is just gonna echo our packet back, so, uh, but I'll show you it's still working quickly. And we see, look, two more packets there. Okay. Um, but one difference now that we would notice is we can do NFP RT sim. Oh, hold on. Pat wire.map because I want to see what it's the name of it is. Up oh, head wire.map because it's too long. Okay, let's let's try running uh, NFP RT sim i32 dot underscore stats. And we hope that the packet went to that island. Uh, whoops, if I could spell. And there uh, we can see uh, we can see packet and byte counts, in, in essence, uh, in there. Now, this packet byte count is a little bit tricky because it's actually uh, it's actually these two words here together um, are are not one packet count in 32 bits and one and one byte count in 32 bits. It's actually there's actually a cutoff in the full 64-bit word, one for the packet, where, where the packets go in the, in the bytes, because usually bytes need a longer width in, in, order to key, in order to count before rolling over. So that's why it kind of looks funny with that hex 28 in the, in the bottom there, because it's actually part of the, the byte count. Um, the packet count, I'm sorry. And yes, yes. Uh, and let's also do NFP RT sim underscore counters. And yes, uh, we see that uh, when we brought up the interface, we got extra packets, uh, which is a, a problem we've been having with this particular server. It's been generating ICMP multicast packets on startup, and so we got some spurious packets along with the, the ones that we sent, unfortunately. But that's why the byte count is 11 and not one. Okay. Uh, now, let's make the, let's, 
let's do a, a slightly more interesting example. Uh, instead of sending the, instead of sending uh, UDP, we'll send UDP underscore V2 dot PCAP, which, uh, well, actually, let me dump that for you first so you can see what's in it. We'll do TCP dump dash R, and then I will just put in some dash N, V, 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 X, 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 ES0, because I'm dumping everything in the packet. And what you will find here is that this is indeed an 802.1Q VLAN packet, length 62, and the VLAN is 2. And you can see the hex dump of that packet below. Okay. So, okay, this is a packet that is on VLAN 2. And what do we expect is going to happen? It's going to go into the firmware. The, header, the VLAN is going to be rewritten to 3 and then sent back out. So, fingers crossed. We'll do UDP v2 dot pcap, and we will hopefully find on our PTCP dump. Well, there are two packets. Ah, here is here is VLAN two, and here is VLAN three. You can see here's the incoming packet VLAN two. Here is the incoming packet on VLAN three. So in fact, we did rewrite the packet. Okay. And we should see different stats increment this time, right? Because we were checking to see whether this was on a VLAN. So let's go, let's go look at the stats quickly. Mm. And here we can see now, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky. I, I could have been in Island 33, right? I said, we noted before, here again, I'll show you the map, wire.map. There are two, oh, head, wire.map. We see that there are two sets of stats, one, one for island 32, one for island 33. And again, I'll dump that stats. And it, the packet happened to land in island 32 both times. It was a coin flip. I got it on a one in four chance, I guess, to get both in the same island. Yay, yay us. But in fact, we see different stats, this one counting VLAN2, and let's do nfprtsim underscore counters. There's only one counters because of the way we declared it. And you'll see, look, one packet sent in on VLAN2, which is here. So that is our, our uh, C wire app in a nutshell. And Gavin will sum up what we have been doing. So you have seen packets go and and uh, and come back. This is this is all great. V three cap. You saw for the receive packet the explicit receive. We add a thread. We get a packet back. We, that was our work queue. Um, you saw the explicit um, atomic transaction for the counters, and you saw the explicit statistics operation. And on the statistics, what was happening there is it was giving it a byte count, and it was using a 64-bit piece of memory with a 35-bit byte count and a 29-bit packet count. It would add the byte count to the bottom 35 bits and increment the packet count, which is why you saw both of the numbers change and why it was not 1 in one and 46 in the other. It was, I think it's um, 80 in in the high order, because it was a 29, it was a 64 quantity split up as 35 and 29 bits. So um, you've seen explicit transactions, you've seen implicit ones. There are very few times when you actually need to play with the assembler. So we've got we, we started uh, we've, we've dug kind of as deep as you're going to go here, um, and I've got really everybody's hands utterly dirty, and you're going to want to go and go back to P4 land, I'm sure, which is fine, but. Um, the highlight here is that you know, it is utterly programmable even down to this level. The takeaway is that you know, when we build our P4 software or our OVS software, uh, we're doing it in assembler or in micro C. We can change it. It's flexible. You know, we can pretty much build anything we want, um, which means that you don't have to get your hands too dirty. Uh, we don't need an operating system on the processor. The hardware is doing everything. It's got its scheduling automatically handled. Uh, we've got automatic management of, of semaphores, locks, queues, and so on. The hardware does all of this for you. So we don't ever take interrupts or anything like that. You know, it, CPU, it, it's all just done for you. All you have to do is program the, uh, the micro engines. 
Now, example applications that, that people have built, and that we built, is we have an OBS switch accelerated Linux NIC. Uh, we've got the P4. Um, integrated NIC, you can throw it in P4. Add your extra functionality. When you do get to my PC, you can play with everything that's here, although, to be honest, you probably will want to stay higher up than Lab 5. You don't have to get this dirty. Um, some folks have built a Linux NIC uh, with the stateful interpreted VM. Um, and others have got eBPF built in. Uh, Microsoft Research had a, a, uh, a paper at um, ACM SIGCOM this year using um, a stateful virtual machine running on every packet as it flows through the, uh, the NIC running on an NFP. There are actually, for those on the researchy side, and you know, this is my software fun hat on, there are a whole bunch of other things you can also do. Um, there's a paper coming out um, in Sigmetrics on PCIe host performance. How fast does a particular x86 core run its PCIe interface? Um, depending on which bits of cache you're accessing, uh, what's the latency for an individual transaction, what's the city, driven entirely by NFP software written in C. So you can really do some useful, odd things. And, and just on the host-driven accelerators, you can do disk data block deduplication uh, offload. We've got a PCIe bus, you've got programmable processors, you can go off and program those in C and do all the hard work that x 86 would rather not do to the data. The world is your oyster. So this all comes basically from the fully flexible architecture. Uh, it's just the serial workers, transactional memories. You write it in C. The transactional memories are doing a lot of the hard work. Who needs a pipeline? You can do anything you want. So that's the lab. Thank you. And thank you, Chris.